Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here at this meeting in honor of Ted. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about some applications of fine structure to basic descriptive set theory. That's, uh, uh, and we'll include uh, what might be called a classical theorem for sigma 1, 3. So the idea is determinacy is very successful in developing the basic structure theory, but then we now have another tool, fine structure theory, and it gives a different perspective of that theory. Sometimes it's able to do things that we don't yet know how to do with determinacy, but there's still theorems, as we will see today, from determinacy for which the fine structure proof is not yet known. So there's lots to do. Okay. So I want to begin with pi one two singletons, and the first connection uh, with singletons and zero sharp is a reformulation of Jensen's covering lemma. If you have a real x, and x is constructible from zero sharp, then either x sharp is in L of zero sharp, or zero sharp is in L of x. Every degree is low. Okay, and that's a simple application of the covering lemma. Now, Kekris and Harrington, now we're gonna analyze pi one two singletons. Suppose for all reals x sharp exists, and that y is a pi one two singleton, then either y is in L of zero sharp, or zero sharps in L of y. So if you look at the pi one two singletons, they're all comparable with zero sharp. Zero sharp is a pi one two singleton. So a pi one two singleton is a real, uh, such that the singleton set of that real is a pi one two set light face. So zero sharp is an analog of zero jump. Now if you combine the two theorems, you get the theorem as Kekris and Harrington really stated it, Again, you assume for every real x sharp exists and that y is a pi one two singleton, then either y sharp is in L of zero sharp or zero sharp is in L of y. So this says that if y doesn't construct zero sharp, it has to be relatively close to L. And now the obvious question is whether this theorem is vacuous. Now Solovey uh, first conjectured that if zero sharp exists, and you have a pi one two singleton, either zero sharp's in L of y, or y is in L, so that this theorem would be vacuous then. And then after the Jensen coding theorem, he conjectured the converse. Uh, he conjectured that if zero sharp exists, then there is a pi one two singleton that is not in L, zero sharp does not construct y, so y is not in L, and y sharp is an L of zero sharp. So we actually conjectured that there is a singleton between zero and zero sharp. Kind of an, uh, a bold conjecture, because where would you get that singleton? The idea, and I think this presumably was behind his first conjecture, well, the real would have to come some, by some form of forcing, and why do you only get one generic? Can't be set forcing. If you have a pi one two singleton that's not an L, and zero sharp exists, it cannot be set generic over L. All right, and then Friedman solved, uh, proves Soloway's conjecture. Suppose zero sharp exists, then there is in fact a pi one two singleton that's not an L, and zero sharp's not an L of Y. So there is a pi one two singleton between zero and zero sharp. Now, Friedman's singleton is very close to L. His construction yields a singleton, in fact, for which the cardinals of L of Y and L are the same. It's not known if Friedman's singletons can be required to be pi one two singletons in all transitive M to which they belong. So zero sharp's a pi one two singleton, but it's a, recognized as a pi one two singleton in every model of Zermelo set theory to which it belongs. And Friedman's uh, singleton does not have that property. So the question is, can you recover, I mean, you, now you can look at variations of Solovey's conjecture where you require that the singleton be far from L. Maybe if you make, require that the singleton be very close to zero sharp in some sense, or have 
a zero Sharpe-like property, there can't be any singletons between L and zero sharp. So that leads to a notion of uh, a quasi-sharp. So this is the definition. Suppose X is a real, so we're looking at a special class of pi one two singletons. So X is a real, and now we have this ordinal. X is an alpha quasi-sharp. If there's a pi one two formula, uh, X is gonna be the pi one two singleton given by that formula, and it will be a pi one two singleton in all models of Zermelo to which it belongs. So it has the zero sharp uniqueness property. Remember the Friedman singleton is not known to have that property. Pardon? What? I can't hear you. It says for all, well, it's for all beta. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, this beta has nothing to do with, I haven't mentioned alpha yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is the local property. It does not involve alpha. Okay, so this first, I'm not done with the definition. Okay. The first property is just that it's a singleton. It's a pi one two singleton witnessed by formula phi, and it's the unique solution to that formula in any Zermelo model to which it belongs. It's well-founded, just like zero sharp. Now, alpha. Suppose Z is a real that codes S. S is a set of X admissible ordinals of order type alpha. Then X is hyperarithmetic in Z. Okay, so X is a singleton, but it's recovered hyperarithmetically from any set of its admissibles of order type alpha. It's a very strong property. Okay, well look, if you have an omega quasi-sharp and it's not an L, then L of X cannot be close to L in any sense. In the, for, for example, L and L of X cannot have the same cardinals. L can't contain in any infinite set of L of X cardinals. Okay? But wait a minute. If X doesn't construct zero sharp, then you have covering between L of X and L, and maybe there's tension here. Okay? All right, so what can we say about these quasi-sharps? So the idea here is to isolate features that zero sharp has, impose those on the pi one two singleton, and then re-ask the solid a question. All right, so zero sharp is an omega quasi sharp. All right, it's certainly a pi one two singleton, but if you know omega many admissibles of zero sharp, you recover zero sharp. Uh, every omega quasi-sharp is recursive in zero dagger. Zero dagger is the sharp of the inner model for one measurable cardinal. So omega quasi-sharps cannot be too complicated. Zero dagger is an omega squared quasi-sharp. It's not an omega quasi-sharp. Okay. okay, so suppose zero sharp exists X is an alpha quasi-sharp for some alpha less than omega one, and X is not an L. Must zero sharp be an L? So we're in L of X. So we're re-asking now the Solovey question, uh, and the strong Solovey conjecture is no, that there should be an alpha quasi-sharp between L and L of zero sharp. But that's got to be really hard to do because of the quasi-sharp condition. If you're going to arrange some class forcing to produce a singleton, well, Friedman did that. But now you have to make sure that singleton is recovered from any set of admissibles of the singleton of sufficient order type. And how do you do that? All right. Now we can relativize this to a real and introduce the notion of an alpha x quasi-sharp. So this is just gonna be an alpha quasi-sharp relative to x. 
So it's just the obvious definition. Suppose x and y are reals, alpha is less than omega 1. Then y is an alpha x quasi-sharp. If we have a pi 1, 2 formula, this is the singleton condition. So x, so y is a pi 1, 2 x singleton, recognized as that in any well-founded model of Zermelo to which it belongs. And then we have the recovery condition. Suppose z codes s and x. S is a set of x, y admissible ordinals. Everything's relativized to x. And s has order type alpha then y is hyperarithmetic in z. So it's just relativizing the notion of an alpha quasi-sharp to a real in the obvious way. All right, now surprisingly, the strong Soloway conjecture holds on a cone. So assume PD, there is an ordinal alpha such that for a Turing cone of x, there's a real y such that y is an alpha x quasi-sharp X is recursive in Y, Y is not an L of X, Y is an L of X sharp, and X sharp is Turing equivalent to Y sharp. So for a cone of X, there is a quasi-sharp singleton between X and X sharp. So the natural conjecture is that there should be one between zero and zero sharp, but this proof gives no insight into that. Uh, so the usual argument would be there has to be uh, uh, quasi-sharp between zero and zero sharp? Well, suppose not. And you prove there can't be one. That proof can't relativize to a real by this theorem. So, there are no, so that would be a very interesting and unprecedented phenomenon where you prove something relative to zero, but it doesn't work relative to x. So if that kind of thing can happen, this would be a natural candidate. All right, so now you can do recursion theory. If you think of the quasi-sharps as the analog of the RE degrees, well, look, you can let P sub X be the partial order of all Y, such that Y is an alpha X quasi-sharp for some alpha ordered by L of X reducibility, and you can stabilize that theory out on a cone. What is it? No idea. Uh, I guess this proof also does not give you an omega quasi-sharp on a cone. It, it does enable you to fix the alpha, but not make alpha small. The other question you can ask, and the proof doesn't really give insight, it could be that the alpha x quasi-sharps are linearly ordered by L of x constructability. Are there incomparable uh, quasi-sharps? I don't know. So, anyway, so there are lots of questions there. All right, so that's it for the pi 1, 2 singletons. Now I want to move on into the projective sets. I'm going to be talking about basically four different topics. So every time I move on, you can forget about the previous one. So now you can forget about quasi-sharps. Yeah? I'm sorry? No. No, I know nothing about. Uh, the, the proof suggests that there is a least one, and they're probably well-ordered by reducibility, but uh, it's, that looks like a hard question. I think Friedman produce, could produce a minimal pi 1, 2 singleton between L and, between zero and zero sharp, and maybe he could even produce two, I don't know. He had some results there. But produce, again, producing a quasi-sharp singleton with class forcing technology looks extremely difficult because of the sharp condition. How do you ensure that the real is recovered from any set of admissibles of the real. Um, anyway. All right, so now we're going to move on to uh, the effective structure of the projective sets. And again, I'm going to state the classical theorems and then state the reinterpretation of those theorems fine structurally and state some improvements. So the basic setting begins with, we assume PD, projective determinacy. If we take an n less than omega, uh, if n is even, there's a largest countable sigma 1n set like this. This is denoted Cn. If n is odd, the pi 1n singletons are pre well ordered under delta 1n reducibility. 
And then Kekris uh, uh, analyzed the odd levels and got that there was a largest countable pi 1 n set on the odd side, and that's also denoted Cn. Okay? So on the even side, there's a largest countable sigma 1 n set. On the odd so at levels, there's a largest countable pi 1 n set. And there's this kind of periodicity, even versus odd, is uh, a basic feature of the projective sets. Okay, C2, now we're going to do the fine structural interpretation of it, is just the reals intersect L. And every element of C2 is recursive in some element of C1. Okay. So let's now move back to sigma 1,1 1, 1 and look at the classical theory. Uh, let's call, let Q1 denote the set of all reals which are recursive in a real that's delta 1,1 1, 1 definable. So Q1 is the set of reals in L eta, where eta is the least admissible, eta is omega 1 CK, Q1 is hype. Okay, and then we have Spectre Gandhi, let eta be the least admissible. Suppose you have a subset of Q1, then the following are equivalent. It's a pi 1 1 set, light face, and it's sigma 1 1 in L eta. Because that's part of the classical theory. So I'm, the reason I'm going through the classical theory, which you all know, is the basic question was, how does this generalize? What? No, sigma 1, 1 in L eta. Right? It's also sigma 1 over L eta. Right? Yeah, sigma 1, 1 in L eta. Right, right. In the universe L eta. It's sigma 1, 1, or sigma 1, if you want. Then we have the sigma 1, 1 basis theorem. If x is a countable sigma 1, 1 set, then x contains only delta 1, 1 reals. Moskovakis, suppose x is a pi 1, 1 singleton, then one of the following holds. Either it's recursive in a real, which is a delta 1, 1 definable, or every sigma 1, 1 set contains an element which is delta 1, 1 in x. Claney Zo is the least pi 1, 1 singleton under delta 1, 1 reducibility, which is not in Q1. So I'm using a notation and a presentation because we want to generalize this. And so the basic question is, how does this generalize to the odd levels of the projective hierarchy above 1? And that was really the beginning of the cabal in LA. A Martin Solovey showed, assume PD, n is less than omega bigger than zero, and n plus one is odd. Suppose x is a pi one n plus one singleton. Then one of the following hold. Either it's recursive in a real which is delta one n plus one definable from an ordinal. That simply means y is delta n definable from alpha and h omega one. So there's a slight change now from the classical theory. We have to bring in the ordinals, and that's necessary. And then the other clause is exactly what you would expect from sigma 1, 1. Every non-empty sigma 1, n plus 1 set contains an element which is delta 1, n plus 1 definable from x. So either uh, the singleton is simple, or simply defined from the singleton, you have a basis. So Qn plus 1 denotes a set of all x such that there is a real y, x is recursive in y, and y is delta 1 n plus 1 alpha definable for some alpha less than omega 1. So as the notation suggests, Qn plus 1 is going to be the analog of Q1. So now we have kind of a uniform projective picture. Assume Pd, 0 is less than n and less than omega, let x be the set of all real z, such that there is a real y. z is recursive in y, and y is delta 1 n alpha definable for some alpha less than omega 1. And this should have been bigger than 1 in this case, I guess. Well, anyway. Suppose n is even, then x is cn, where cn is the largest countable sigma 1 n set. Suppose n is odd, then x is qn, qn is a pi 1n set, 
And QN is contained in CN. Remember, CN at the odd levels is the largest countable pi 1n set. Okay, so that's, so now there's almost a uniform definition which gives you either CN or QN depending on whether you're at the even or odd levels. But we'd like to get a more uniform picture. And that's where fine structure comes in. Remember, C2 are the reals in L. Hype are the reals in L omega 1 CK. So there should be a generalization of L omega 1 CK and it, L and so forth that recovers these sets. And the generalization comes from the Mitchell Steele models. Suppose n is less than omega, mn is the Mitchell Steele least proper class iterable Mitchell Steele model with n many wooden cardinals. I'm not going to define these. Suppose mn exists for all n, then mn sharp exists for all n. Each mn is L of a set. And mn sharp is characterized by just being alpha iterable for all alpha less than omega 1. So the mn's are class models, and the definition of mn, or the iterable one, involves it's a class notion. But if they all exist, everything gets localized to h omega 1. mn sharp, of course, will be a real. The question is, can it be recognized locally? And the answer is yes. And that's the iterability condition. So putting together a lot of theorems, uh, so I'll attribute this to the cabal. The following are equivalent, PD, and for each n less than omega, mn sharp exists. So this is, is bold-face PD, not light-face. Okay? So projective determinacy really is just equivalent to the existence of the mn sharps. Okay, so then we get a unified theory, fine structure meets determinacy. Again, I'll attribute this to the cabal because it's combining many theorems. Assume PD, n is less than omega bigger than zero and n is even. Then mn sharp exists and mn sharp is a pi one n plus two singleton. And the reals of mn are cn plus two. So the first case where this is in force is M2, and it tells you that C4, the largest countable sigma 1, 4 set, are the reals in the canonical intermodel for two wooden cardinals. So that's a generalization that C2 is the reals in L. So Mn sharp is a generalization of silver 0 sharp to level N plus 2. What about the odd levels? Same thing. Suppose now n is less than omega and n is odd, then m and pd, so mn sharp exists, mn sharp is a pi 1 n plus 2 singleton. They're always singletons and you add 2. The reals now of mn are qn plus 2. And then mn sharp is the least pi 1 n plus 2 singleton under delta 1 n plus 2 reducibility that's not in qn plus 2. So mn sharp at these odd levels is the generalization of Kleene zone. So if you look at the case in the first non-trivial case one, then q3 are just the reals of the inner model for one wooden. m1 sharp is the least pi 1, 3 singleton under delta 1, 3 reducibility that's not in q3. Okay, but remember we get a basis theorem but in the fine structure view, you get a much finer version of that basis theorem. And so I'd like to state that theorem. So now we're going to be assuming PD and N is odd. Let delta be the least wooden cardinal of MN. Remember, MN is the inner model with N many wooden cardinals. And suppose X is a non-empty sigma 1 N plus 2 set. So think N equals 1 then x is a non-empty sigma 1, 3 set. Now we know m1 sharp by the previous theorem is the least pi 1, 3 singleton not in q3, so from m1 sharp we should be able to compute an element of x. But it turns out that m1 sharp is overkill, and that's the new ingredient. So there's a partial order p, uh, in Mn, which is delta Cc in Mn, and there's a term for a real relative to that partial order 
so that every M generic filter on P interprets tau as a member of X. So the basis theorem, MM sharp is overkill. Right? MM sharp will build such a generic because it will make it countable. So this is the best possible basis theorem at the odd levels. Uh, it implies X contains a member which is recursive in MN sharp and much more. So what's playing the role of Claney's O is not really MN sharp. The, the true basis, it's, it's just like uh, for, for the basis theorem for sigma 1,1, one, one, it, it's the theory of L eta that you're really interested in, where eta is omega 1 CK. Here, it's just MN that you're interested in. MN sharp is way too much information. And there are applications of this, but so that's an example where the fine structure gives you new insight, but notice not entirely fair because the conclusion here, you can't phrase in the classical theory because it refers to MN. And so the question is gonna be whether this leads to any new theorems, and we'll see that it does in a while. But now I wanna move on. Well, first of all, what about the pi one N plus two singletons and MN sharp where N is even? So remember, if N is two, there's a pi one two singleton between zero and zero sharp, so you can now ask the anal analogous question at all levels, but again, we're only gonna get a cone result, so let's relativize. So suppose N is even, bigger than zero, CN plus two of X is the largest countable sigma one N plus two X set. For each real X, MN X is MN relativized to X. MN of X sharp is a pi one N plus two in X singleton. The reals of MN X are CN plus two of X. Everything just carries over. Well, yes? I'm sorry? What set? Last slide? What? Well, I just need it to be on non-empty. <laughs> yeah, if, if, it's, if it's countable, then uh, all of its members are in MN by the, by the Moscow Vox. I'll be oh, saying yeah. that before. This is an uncountable set, possibly. It's any non-empty sigma 1n plus 2 set. By, by Q theory, it's, it's gonna contain a member which is definable, simply definable from MN sharp. This is giving you a much finer, if you know MN, you can generate a member of X by forcing in a canonical way. So that's a lot sharper than saying it has a solution uh, recursive in MN sharp. The partial order P is definable, so MN sharp makes it countable. No. It's a partial order of size delta in the model. It's, uh, for those of you who know, it's the extender algebra. Nothing, I mean, there could be a connection that's not known or not been looked at. All right, so now uh, we're looking at, at the even levels where the singletons are not pre-well ordered, we're asking whether there's a singleton between zero and the analog of zero sharp. And there's a cone result, PD, suppose N is even, then for a Turing cone of X, there is a real Y. Y is a pi one N plus two singleton relative to X. Uh, y is recursive in MN of X sharp. A Y is not in CN plus two of X, Y is not in L, as the analogous statement, and MN sharp of X is not in CN plus two of Y. So this is an intermediate single, singleton. And in fact, you can arrange that MN sharp of Y has the same Turing degree as MN sharp of X. Okay, now you'd say, well, why doesn't Friedman's proof just give us this light face? And the reason is there's a difference between MN sharp round bracket X 
and square brackets x. So in general, if x is generic over mn sharp, the extension of mn sharp, of mn, I'm saying if x is generic over mn, in general, uh, mn, the extension of mn by x is not mn relativized to x. So trying to adapt the Friedman uh, proof is quite subtle. But the, the quasi-sharp proof does adapt quite easily. So for a cone of x, there are singletons at the appropriate even levels between 0 and the analog of 0 sharp. It's not known light phase. OK, so now we want to move on. We're going to go just beyond the projective sets, pi 1 omega and sigma 1 omega plus 1. So pi 1 omega is analogous to pi 0 1, taking the reals as bare space, and sigma 1 omega plus 1 is analogous to sigma 1 1. Now, as a set theorist, I hate these quantifiers, these levels because I like to use formulas of set theory. So how do you tell whether something is sigma 1 and omega, sigma 1 omega plus 1 with a, through the set theoretical lens? OK, well, it's pretty easy. Suppose you have a set of reals, then A is sigma 1 omega plus 1 definable light phase. If for some formula in the language of set theory in all reals Z, Z belongs to A if and only if there's a transitive set M, M models are mellow or as much set theory as you want. Projective correctness, M is a sigma 1N elementary substructure of V for all N. And then Z is an M and M thinks phi of Z. So in a sigma 1 omega plus 1 way, it's just saying something happens in a model that's projectively correct. And frequently that's, at least for me, much easier to think about what you can express that way. I suppose for recursion theorists, it's the opposite. All right, so what about Q theory at sigma 1 omega plus 1? Well, the basic theory goes through. Moskovakis assume AD. Again, this is far more determinacy than you need. Uh, then the pi 1 omega plus 1 singletons are well ordered under delta 1 omega plus 1 reducibility. And you have Q theory. Suppose x is a pi 1 omega plus 1 singleton then one of the following holds. It's either recursive in a pi 1 omega singleton and a countable ordinal, or every non-empty sigma 1 omega plus 1 set contains a, re a real which is recursive in some pi 1 omega singleton relative to x. So I'm moving from the delta definability to singletons, because that's what the proofs all give. So I'm not quite sure what the correct notation should be here, whether it should be Q pi 1 omega or Q sigma 1 omega plus 1. Is it Q omega or Q omega plus 1? But I put the point class in, it makes it unambiguous. So Q pi 1 omega denotes a set of all reals which are recursive in some pi 1 omega alpha singleton for some ordinal alpha. So it's just, it's just like the first level. OK, but let's move up to uh, the third level. Things are a little cleaner there. So if you put together all the theorems of the cabal and you assume AD, first, if you have a real, then the following are equivalent. It's in M1, it's in Q3, and it's recursive in a pi 1, 2 alpha singleton for some countable ordinal. And then M1 sharp is at least pi 1, 3 singleton under delta 1, 3 reducibility, which is not in Q3. So those are the theorems I already talked about. And the question is, what's the analogous question and characterization of Q at the level pi 1 omega? For example, what plays the role of M1? There should be some kind of fine structure model whose reals are exactly uh, Q pi 1 omega. And then what's the least pi 1 omega plus 1 singleton, which is not in Q pi 1 omega? And what plays the role of M1 sharp? So these questions were looked at in the 90s by a student of steel. Uh, but before I do that, I have to make some definitions. So uh, and here n is less than omega bigger than 0. I want to define the notion of an n-full model. 
Suppose B is a subset of alpha for some countable ordinal alpha, then mn sharp of B is just mn sharp relativized to B in the obvious way. All extenders have critical point bigger than soup B. Okay, so assume AD and M is a countable iterable Mitchell Steele model such that M models are mellow and N is less than omega, then we'll say M is N full if for all gamma less than the ordinals of M, MN sharp of M restricted to gamma belongs to M. So for those of you who are familiar with inner models, it's saying that for every gamma, you have MN built over that within the model. All right, so uh, M, N full models and generic projective correctness. Uh, suppose you have a countable iterable Mitchell Steele model, it's a model of Zumello, then the following are equivalent. M is N full for all N less than omega. That was that technical definition I just gave, but here's a really nice uh, simple condition that's equivalent. Suppose G is M generic for some partial order in M, then you form the extension of M by G. It's a Zermela model, that's not a problem. You intersect with V omega plus one, and that's elementary in V omega plus one. So uh, an iterable Mitchell Steele model is N full for all N if and only if it, all of its generic extensions are projectively correct. Okay, so that's a nice conceptual surrogate for the more technical notion of being um, N full. Okay, so Rudemeyer uh, defined two versions of models. Sum AD, a countable iterable sound, Mitchell Steele model uh, satisfying Zermelo, is a Rudemeyer stack, obviously he didn't call it a Rudemeyer stack, if it's N full for all N, and now a smallness condition. Basically, uh, well, so for each N, let gamma N be least such that gamma is a cardinal of M, gamma is a wooden cardinal in MN relativized to M restricted to gamma. Now that may not exist, but we require it exists for all N, and we require that the ordinals of M are the soup of these. So some kind of smallness condition. It's saying uh, technical condition. Okay, now we can do a slight variant of this and define an admissible Rudemeyer stack. So in a stack, what you have, if you were to draw it, this is the model. It's a model of Zermelo, so the cardinals are cofinal. So you're looking at a gamma such that you can build over gamma MN without, uh, and have gamma stay wooden. Then you take the least and take the soup over N, that's supposed to go all the way up. Okay, so M1 is not, M1 restricted to, um, or M omega, the inner model for omega woodens restricted to any of its woodens is not a Rudemeyer stack. Too much reflection. All right, so now we're going to strengthen this slightly, uh, define an admissible Rudemeyer stack. So it's gotta be a Rudemeyer stack, so it satisfies all of this, but then, uh, uh, if we construct a relative to M up to the first admissible past the height of M, so we're going up to the first admissible now, but just constructing, then we generate no new bounded subsets of the ordinals of M. We don't project, to use a fine structural notion. So we have the Rudemeyer stack, and then the, the admissible stack Everything survives when you, as you construct up to the first admissible. So it feels like the admissible Rudemeyer stack is an analog of L omega 1 CK. It's not clear what the Rudemeyer stack is an analog to. So Rudemeyer uh, analyzed these models. So we let M0, whenever you have a notion uh, defined for iterable Mitchell Steele models, there's always going to be a least in the natural order of comparison. So we let M0 be uh, the Mitchell Steele least Rudemeyer stack. Uh, then every real of M0 is recursive in a pi one omega alpha singleton for some alpha less than omega one. So in the minimal stack, 
the reals are all in Q, pi 1 omega. Okay, now what if you move to the least uh, Mitchell Steele least admissible Rudemeyer stack? We'll call that M0 plus. Suppose Y is a pi 1 alpha, pi 1 omega alpha singleton for some alpha less than omega 1. Then Y is in M0 plus, yes? No, because uh, it's less than the omega 1 of the, mo of the model. So remember, when you move to generalizing hype to the higher levels, you have to bring in the ordinals. Okay. And, and I, maybe I should have said, look at Q1. It was uh, 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 the reals that are delta 1, 3 and alpha for a countable ordinal. Why isn't it just the reals that are delta 1, 3? That would be the analog of hype. But when you move past the first level, if you construct from Q3, you add no reals. Now you have Spectre Gandhi, so L of Q3 will correctly compute all the delta 1, 3 reals. So not every real can be delta 1, 3. So that's why you have to bring in the ordinals. All right, so M0 plus is the Mitchell Steel least admissible Rudemeyer stack, and then Rudemeyer showed that every pi 1 omega alpha singleton belongs to that model. So we have two models, M0, and all the reals there are in Q, pi 1 omega. We have this bigger model, and we know that Q pi 1 omega is contained in that bigger model. And so the question is, which is the right model, or is neither correct? So what's the Mitchell Steele least model, projecting to omega, such that M contains all the reals, which are pi 1 omega alpha singleton for some alpha? What's the analog of M1? for Q pi 1 omega. You know, it should be either M0 or M0 plus or some weird model in between. And the answer turns out to be the bottom model. So that's a, a relatively recent theorem. Suppose let M0 be the Mitchell Steele least Rudemeyer stack. Suppose Y is a pi 1 omega alpha singleton for some alpha less than omega 1, then Y is an M0. So it's the bottom model, the Mitchell, the Rudemeyer stack, the least one. That's the analog of M1. Okay, so let M0 be the Mitchell Steele least Rudemeyer stack. Let sigma be Q pi 1 omega. Then sigma is the reals of M0, and sigma is uh, the reals intersect L of sigma. Okay, so again, so now the fine structure theory has provided an analysis of Q at the omega level, but the machinery gives you a new theorem. So first, we can complete the fine structural analysis of Q theory at sigma 1 omega plus 1. Let M0 be the Mitchell Steele least Rudemeyer stack. Let TM0 be the theory of M0, not M0 sharp, just the theory. Then the reals of M0 are Q at the, at the uh, I see I'm inconsistent on my notation. I switched to pi 1 omega plus 1, but that's a typo. Uh, TM0, that theory is a pi 1 omega plus 1 singleton. It's the least pi 1 omega plus 1 singleton under delta 1 omega plus 1 reducibility, which is not in the Q at this level. And we get a basis theorem. Suppose x is sigma 1 omega plus 1, light phase, and x is non-empty, then x contains an element which is recursive in TM0. So this really is analogous to hype and clean ease O because we're getting the basis just recursively in the theory of a model. The theory of, of, uh, of L omega 1 CK is essentially clean ease O. It's arithmetic in it in any way. Okay, so that completes the analysis. But now you can use this machinery to uh, get a new theorem. So uh, Paul talks about trees and scales. So we'll let, uh, for every uh, sigma 1n formula that defines a scale on a sigma 1n set, there's a tree associated to that. We call it T sub phi, and we take the direct sum. Let eta be the least admissible, it's a set of ordinals naturally, let eta be the least admissible relative to this tree. 
So L eta T1 omega is analogous to L omega 1 CK. And in fact, the reals of L eta T1 omega is the appropriate Q. Less, more subtle, the reals are actually present in the model. We're only constructing up to the admissible. Conceivably, reals could be generated cofinally, but if you don't, so you have to be a little careful about that. And then uh, you get the analog for M1. Let eta be the least admissible relative to T1 omega. Suppose uh, X is a subset of the Q. Then the following are equivalent. X is pi 1 omega plus 1. X is sigma 1 omega plus 1 definable in the L eta of T1 omega. That's spectra Gandhi at this level. But now we get the, the uh, Keckers-Martin theorem. X is sigma 1 definable with T as a parameter in this model. Now this direction's easy. The problem is to show that if X is sigma 1 T1 omega definable in here, Y is X pi 1 omega plus 1. Looks like it could be more complicated. Okay, now back to sigma 1, 3. So now you can forget everything. New topic. And I'm getting to, I have a 15 minutes left. I'm getting to the new theorem. So, so assume PD and X is a countable sigma 1, 3 set. Uh, then there's a pi 1, 2 singleton. Y such that every element of X is recursive in Y. Right. Every countable sigma 1, 3 set contains only delta 1, 3 definable reals, and this is slightly stronger than that because it's giving you a pi 1, 2 singleton that computes them all. Suppose E is an equivalence relation on some set Z. Then a subset of Z is E invariant if X is simply a union of E equivalence classes. The E closure of a subset of Z, that's where the equivalence relation lives, is the union of all the equivalence classes of A where A is an X. Natural notion. Okay, so here's the new theorem. I'll call it the E basis theorem for sigma 1, 3. So suppose E is a sigma 1, 2 equivalence relation on some sigma 1, 2 set Y. Everything's light face. Suppose X is a subset of Y is E invariant and X is a light face sigma 1, 3 set. Suppose X contains only countably many E equivalence classes. Then there's a pi 1, 2 singleton Y such that every E equivalence class of X contains an element which is recursive in Y. Now this is stronger than the Moskvakis theorem, just take E to be the trivial equivalence relation then X would be countable. Okay. So this generalizes the Moskovakis theorem. So far, this is a relatively recent theorem, so it's a little dangerous to say, so far, there's no this is a classical theorem. This should have been proved in the 70s. But I don't see how to prove it without fine structure. So for those of you familiar with fine structure, this proof uses M1 and it uses both the extender algebra and the stationary tower. All right. Now, you might say, well, maybe there's a, a simpler way to do this. Notice that X has to be bold face sigma 1, 2. So X is both light face sigma 1, 3 and bold face sigma 1, 2. So you have a complicated light face set with a simpler bold face definition. Well, maybe that just implies X is sigma 1, 2 in a real T, which is delta 1, 3 definable, and that would easily give the E basis theorem. In fact, to give you a much stronger theorem. But that theorem's not, that you can't prove that. Let X be the set of all L, Q, 3, or if you want, M1 generic Cohen reals. Then X is a G delta set, and X is not empty. X intersect Q3 is empty, and X is light phase sigma 1, 3. So here's a light phase sigma 1, 3 set that's extremely simple, bold phase, it's a G delta set, but it has no members in Q3, so it can't even be sigma 1, 2 in any delta 1, 3 real. So you can't hope to do an end run and prove the theorem by another means. And this turns out to be, can, uh, 
connected to a forgotten question of Kekris. So Kekris made the following observation. Suppose E is a light phase sigma 1, 2 equivalence relation on some light phase sigma 1, 2 set. Well, suppose X is a subset of Y. It's E invariant and is sigma 1, 3. But now suppose X contains just one E equivalence class. In the E basis theorem, we assumed it had only countably many. But suppose it has just one. Well, then X is delta 1, 3, right? Because you can say I'm not in X if I'm not E equivalent to something in X. Not E equivalent to pi 1, 2. So this is a sigma 1, 3 definition for the complement. So the forgotten question of Kekris was, assume PD, suppose X is a light phase delta 1, 3 set and X is bold phase sigma 1, 2, must X be sigma 1, 2 in a real which is delta 1, 3? Okay, so maybe the stronger theorem holds. Rouveau proved a partial result in the 70s. Suppose X is a light phase delta 1, 3 set and X is bold phase pi 1, 1 then X is sigma 1, 2 in some delta 1, 3 real. And as far as uh, Aleko knows, that's the last theorem on this problem. So if you want to prove a classical theorem, now I don't know the answer to Kepris' question. The fine structure doesn't really seem to help. I suspect it's going to go through a generalization of the Kepris-Martin. All right, what about sigma 1 omega plus 1? Assume ADL of R. Assume uh, X is a countable light phase sigma 1 omega plus 1 set, then there is a pi 1 omega singleton such that every member of X is recursive in Y. Theorem just carries over. It's third periodicity. Is there a fine structure proof? The analysis of uh, Q at the omega or omega plus 1 level, because the uh, Rudemeyer stacks don't have quite enough reflection in them, I don't see how to prove this theorem. And because I don't know how to prove this theorem, I don't know how to prove the E basis theorem, which should be true, so I'll state that as a question. Uh, suppose N is less than omega, E is a sigma 1N light phase equivalence relation on R. Suppose X is an E invariant set, such that X is light phase sigma 1 omega plus 1. Suppose X has only countably many E equivalence classes. Must there be a pi 1 omega singleton, such that every E class of X contains an element recursive in Y? I don't know the answer, surely true, but again, the proof uh, at the third level uses features of M1 which do not hold for the Rudemeyer stack. But this question in turn leads to another question which is really what I'm gonna end with and I think is an interesting classification problem. So it's related to one about E invariant measures. So E invariant measures, let sigma projective be the smallest sigma algebra containing all the projective sets. Suppose E is a projective equivalence relation on R, let sigma projective E be all the E invariant sets. So we're just looking at the sigma algebra of the projective sets. We have a light phase projective equivalence relation. Uh, I might as well make it on all the reals because we don't care now. Suppose we have an ultra filter on sigma projective of E. So this is an ultra filter on the E invariant sets. We'll say it's indecomposable if for every projective pre will ordering with E invariant classes, the measure has to pick a component, it has to be principal there. Okay, so this is factoring out the measures on ordinals. I don't want to look at measures on ordinals. So you can't use this measure or this ultra filter to generate an ultra filter on ordinals. But let's make it simple. We'll say U is Borel generated if, if mu is generated by the E closure of Borel sets. Okay? So we'll let, I can't say this because I don't know how to speak in fonts, but U sigma projective E denotes all such ultra filters. There's no definability condition here, it's just. Uh, Notice that the uh, in decomposability condition uh, shows that U has to be countably complete. Because I use a sigma algebra. Okay. All right, so here's the classification problem. Suppose you have a proper class of wooden cardinals, E is projective, and mu is such an ultra filter. Must U, mu be universally bare? Well, I think if you assume C8, probably not. 
that occurred to me this morning, but what I'm really interested in is suppose that U is universally bare, must mu be projected? That's the classification problem. And this is related to the E basis problem. If it has to be projective and you can do it in the right setting, then you get the E basis problem. Now, maybe I should have given an example of such ultra filters. Take a, take a mod finite equivalence on omega to the omega. That's ergodic. So Lebesgue measure gives you an indecomposable Borel generated ultra filter. Okay, so this is some generalization on that. Okay, so the question is, can one hope to classify these? Obviously, it's gonna depend upon E, maybe, and whether or not you can classify these ultra filters might give you, define a new class of equivalence relations. So there is a theorem one can prove. The iterable model hypothesis is the assumption that the Mitchell steel models with measurable wooden iterable models exist. That's an open problem, but uh, surely they do. Suppose E is a projective equivalence relation. Then the following are equivalent. You have uh, an ultra filter, which is Borel generated and indecomposable, which is not universally bare. So you have a pathological ultra filter. Well, that's equivalent to there are two to the C many such ultra filters. So if you can have an ultra, for one equivalence, any equivalence relation, you just pick it in advance. If, and you assume CH and the iterable model hypothesis, if you, can ha if you have an ultra filter which is not universally bare, so not nice, then you have two to the C many of them. So it suggests there should be some freeness thing going on. There should be an indexed family of, by C, by reals of sets and variant sets in their complement such that you can pick any sequence of those and extend to an ultra filter. The problem is the indecomposability condition, because whenever there's a projective pre-will ordering, you have to pick one of the components. And then there's a Borel generated condition. Every set that you designate to be of measure one has to contain the, uh, the uh, closure of a Borel set, which you've also set as of measure one. So it's not clear. Anyway, so I think that's an interesting question. I really suspect here that uh, uh, you can construct, even for tail equivalents maybe, uh, construct uh, one that's not universally bare, but you may really need CH, so there's a consistency problem there. But it's this is the question I was really interested in. In other words, in the AD plus world, are there arbitrarily co complicated uh, ultra filters? So Kekris has analyzed in the AD plus world uh, ultra filters on ordinals, and they're all uh, understandable and they can't be very complicated. If you assume ADR, and you take any gamma less than theta, there is a map from the reals onto all the ultra filters on gamma, and you can classify them. So uh, the question is whether there's an analogous theorem uh, for these ultra filters. Okay, that's it, thank you. Well, so I didn't think, yeah, so the idea was, now maybe this doesn't work, the idea would be you start with a Borel set, and you put Lebesgue measure on it, and pick, designate some sets of measure one, and shrink down. Then you put a new measure on the new set, and keep doing this, right? But at various stages, you wanna go off measure. So you should be able to build a tree of height omega one, every branch, the problem is to keep this construction going, you have to intersect your sets at limit stages and make sure they're not empty. And you don't want it to be measured, so you just diagonalize. So it seemed plausible, but I don't know, maybe I'm falling into a trap. Remember, you, so CH enables you to enumerate all the constraints, namely all the projective pre-will orderings. 
And so you have to make sure that you pick a component. But if at some stage uh, uh, your current set is just a Borel set, right, then you, you put Lebesgue measure on it, you look at your next projective pre-well ordering, right, there's got to be a component that you can choose a positive measure and you pick that. Okay, then you throw away the measure and shrink down. The trouble is, at limit stages, at some point, uh, you have to keep splitting. So you can't just stick with one measure. And maybe as you keep splitting, you're going to end up with branches whose intersection is non-empty. So you need a side condition on these, these. You need a largeness notion of Borel sets that you can keep shrinking and be guaranteed that the intersections at limit stages are non-empty. And you have to be able to put Lebesgue measure on the set and then pick a component and keep it large. And you have to keep splitting. And I don't know, it seemed maybe plausible. Uh, but uh, with CH anyway, without CH, this would be hopeless. So it could be that it's consistent that every, that the answer to the first question is uh, yes, maybe even with MM or something. It's hard to see how you keep this construction going. Uh, um, how would you go past limit stages of omega one? I mean, I just don't know. Again, I, I, that's the second question which uh, I'm more interested in: uh, whether universally bare implies that the measure can be classified. Maybe it has to be simple. Maybe if it's universally bare. So in the AD plus world. Maybe all these measures have to be projective, that you can't build a complicated measure. I just don't know. I mean, again, I've not really thought about this. This is just when you try to prove the E basis theorem for sigma 1 omega plus 1, you end up in a situation not with a proper class of Woodens, but you end up in the situation where you have one of these measures, it's universally bare in the universe that you're in, you have global projective determinacy. So that's got to be an unusual object, and uh, maybe it can't exist. Maybe it has to be projective, in which case I get the basis there. I mean, more likely, and I think that's an interesting question, there, is there's a classical proof of the E basis theorem. Some twist on uh, uh, some clever game gives you the E basis theorem for sigma 1, 3. Some generalization of the theorem that gives you that countable sigma 1, 3 sets contain only delta 1, 3 real. But if you look at that proof, it's a little clear how you would adapt it to the equivalence relation setting. What's Silver's theorem? Oh, uh, I don't know. I have to think about it. Um, but this, this sigma one, so you're, I don't see that this is related. You think it's going to be pi one three? I mean, all I did is I asked Kekris this. What? Yeah, but, but analyzing on the sigma side is harder. Uh, I asked Kekris whether he knew this theorem. He said, no, I had no idea. He said, um, that's when he made that observation that if you have one equivalent class, it's delta 1, 3. So I haven't thought uh, at all about it. I mean, the proof. Uh, I mean, the, I don't see, I mean, you could ask, there's a hype version of this, and maybe someone was going to ask. The question is, is there an E basis question you could ask for sigma 1, 1? And so I thought about it just a little bit. Uh, and the trouble there is you have to be careful what space you're in. You don't want to be in, in uh, omega to the omega. Uh, but if you're in 2 to the omega, then, so if you're in, you don't want to be an omega to the omega because there's a closed set, right? There's a pi zero one set 
as a close, a light phase closed set in omega to the omega that contains no height member. So you're not going to get, so the only thing you could do is work with sigma zero one, and that's trivial. So if you have a, you can't do sigma one one invariant for pi zero one equivalence relations because uh, if, you, if you're doing an E basis theorem, <laughs> You got to know that if the equivalence class has only one member, that it contains a member in, in whatever where you're trying to get the basis. So the sigma 1 1 version is false for pi 0 1 equivalence relations in omega to the omega because there's this closed set. I mean, there's. Uh, uh, so what about. Uh, but in 2 to the omega. Uh, so you can show. Um, uh, so, so I'm not sure there. Uh, so there's a, there's a, you can define a uh, sigma one one set in two to the omega which is closed and, ha and non-empty and has no height member. But obviously you can't define a light phase pi zero one set in two to the omega that has no height member by compactness. So the sigma one one candidate would be, suppose you have a light phase sigma one one set that's E invariant for a light phase sigma zero two equivalence relation and contains only countably many classes. Must each class contain a height member? And that would be the analog of the sigma one. And I don't know, I haven't thought about it. Uh, so that, that one could ask that question. But the trouble is, is it feels a little unnatural because you have to be in the right as a set theorist, I don't like to be in a situation where two to the omega is different than omega to the omega. And, uh, and it doesn't seem to be a, any sensible formulation in omega to the omega. But uh, the two to the omega one does. And the example of the sigma one one set that's closed in two to the omega without a height member rules out the simple proof, right? You can't hope, right? If you could show that a sigma one one set that's closed contains a height member, then the E invariant, you know, but that's false. So, um, anyway, that's. So, going back to the middle class, what's the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh-huh. Yes, I haven't. I haven't looked at. It. I haven't thought about. It. I'd have to think about it. I mean, um, uh, uh huh. Yeah, no, I don't. I mean, isn't it still open to analyze? Um, pardon? Yeah. Yeah. But I think even analyzing the CNs for Anna Odd is open, fine structurally. They should be the master codes. And I, I think that's still open. I don't, you know, so so C, uh, C2 should correspond uh, to, or, or um, C3 should correspond to the stages of M1 that project to omega in some sense, or something like that. Pardon? I'm sorry? M2. I mean, M2, right. So uh, I don't, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of questions like that that are, you know, it's uh, open. Uh, 